Hello everyone and once again thank you for joining me with another security professionals training tutorial. This session we're going to be covering better risk assessments, management tools and metrics. For those who don't know me, my name is Tony Ridley. Uh, I'm currently engaged and work as a consultant, speaker, author and advisor. If you want to know any further details about my background or experiences to date, please visit my website or send me an email. So first of all, what this session is going to be focusing on is precisely as the title suggests. I'm going to be looking at the provision and conduct of uh, risk assessments, the further ongoing risk management, some of the tools and metrics associated because in reality we can't improve what we can't measure. So first of all, this is not a mathematical theory session. This is not about supporting or debunking any particular standard. This is about achieving business enabling processes, not being business prohibitors, not being extremely risk adverse. This is a universal approach to help businesses approach their risk management methodology. For, so for those who um, already have risk management in place, this will be a means of benchmarking, validating, or simply being introduced to new terms, methodologies, or processes to validate or reinforce what you currently have. For those that don't have anything in place, this is food for thought. This is not the final solution. These are all customizable. Every business is not the same. So therefore, all the processes have to vary dependent on the skills of the individual conducting it, the appetite of the organization, and the context in which they conduct their business. So this provides an overview and compares some of those particular processes. Now, the disciplines and research that's gone into this particular session has been derived from a lot of subsets. So I've looked and reviewed at engineering, the economic, security, risk management, finance, health and safety, and obviously some of the mathematic areas because they're all different. Everyone has a different or conflicting opinion in many instances, but what I've done is an attempt to rationalise or overview and encapsulate some of the best of all of those particular processes and functions. So what I'll cover shortly is a synopsis or overview of, of, of lots of those elements, and there'll be a bibliography at the end of some of the other resources for further reading. So when we talk about risk assessments in particular, there's a number of inherent processes both that as human beings we have to be aware of, particularly with our risk choice taking, um, and also the mathematical equations and a number of evolving theories. So we have the Gaussian normal curves, otherwise known as the bell curves, um, which is primarily for measuring error, not accuracy. It's about the distribution from a median concept. We've got prospect theory, we've got uh, failure of invariance, we've got the avoidance of particular processes, regression to the mean, which is uh, simply uh, put is that everything pretty much comes back to a standard process. You know, tall people don't continue to have ever taller and taller children. Small or short people don't continue to have shorter and shorter children. Okay, all of these sorts of things regress to, back to a mean or an average. Um, and much the same applies when we talk about risk management. We've got game theory. We've got uh, mental accounting. We've got uh, ambiguity aversion, which is a typical human factor to try and rationalise or put a name and a face to things. Um, so they'll overly simplify or simply make things up. Behavioural finances, um, standard deviation, and the list goes on. So again, all of these key factors, I recommend that you re actually research and look into them. So these are some of the most progressive and the most relevant aspects associated to risk management, and I recommend that you actually have a look at some of these, and I'm going to talk about some of these in a little bit more detail. Uh, detail and this all is derivatives of things like probability. So first of all, why do we even focus on or consider risk management? Well, the reality is the essence of risk management lies in the maximizing the areas where we have some control over the outcome, whilst striving to minimize the areas where we have absolutely no control over the outcome and the linkage between effect and cause is hidden from us. That's the reality. We simply don't hold, have all of the information. So who are the people who are doing this? This is not the space of primarily the risk management people. It's every business leader and business executive because the successful business executive, executive is a forecaster first. Purchasing, producing, marketing, pricing, and organization all follow that process. It's about preemptive. It's about looking forward and humans adapt to change. Despite what people will tell you about change management, we all deal with change every single Single day, but this is about forecasting and looking forward. So, how do we go about this? Well, first and foremost, um, and I know this is going to enrage and excite a number of people, but measurement always dominates intuition. 
the reality is it has to be a numerical based system. Now, there's a number of ways about, about distilling and capturing the information, but it has to be numerically based. It has to have content so we can understand a scale, a magnitude, and a comparative scale, and numbers simply do this much, much better than word pictures. So managing risk is the assumption and the convergence of three basic requisites. That is full information, independent trials, and the relevance of quantitative valuation. Now, those three proofs, those three elements alone debunk most, most of the non-scientific hokum, anything that, that is deemed as a risk methodology. If you can't exhibit those three elements or strive to those three elements, then simply you're falling short and you should acknowledge that or you're applying or practicing some other discipline altogether. Some sage advice that I found in the research, something that um, I certainly uh, coined the phrase quite a lot, is the information you have is not the information you want. The information you want is not the information you need. The information you need is not the information you can obtain, and the information you can obtain costs more than you want to pay. And that's the reality for most businesses. So when information is lacking, we have to fall back on inductive reasoning and try and guess the odds. And that's the reality. If there is no mathematical proofs, is there is no empirical data, um, essentially it comes down to an educated guess, a refined guess, or a, um, a, a, a developed um, methodology of chance and associated numerical values. But if we don't have the information, we don't have the information. We should be transparent and acknowledge it. So part of the problem when we communicate this is it's all about the, the graphical interface or the descriptions as well. So one of the elements that I use in terms, and I recommend in terms of making sure or understand the difference between outliers, that is extreme or extraordinary events, is standard deviation. So where we have the mean or the medium, we have the clustering or the majority of group of activities and even our forecasts should fall around that space. Now, it's not saying that outliers and extraordinary events don't take place, but it's understanding how far from the center they are and certainly how frequent the volume that we're actually dealing with and we shouldn't be having these extreme left and right of arcs in terms of events and this is how we incorporate this and I'll talk about how we incorporate this into our risk methodology for so for here example we have a threat assessment now this threat assessment here there's a number of flaws associated in this but it uses the principles of a heat map process where the more red is is the higher uh, potential for risk or forecasted risk um, the amber, the yellows and so on, a middle ground and green obviously a lower end of scale. So in this methodology, there's been segmentation associated with the asset class being you know, people, information, processes, concept and so on. Um, the value, the utility value and that is the value derived from a particular asset, not just the cost of replacement or maintenance in itself. And business importance. Now you'll see there in the drop down box there under the nine with a zero to 10, is this is an opportunity and a process where you can also add a degree of significance or importance to particular functions. So in this instance, business importance was a sliding scale between zero and 10 because um, there was many different multifaceted businesses, there was different uh, divergences, and it was important to amplify or prioritize certain business importances outside of the assessment of the actual naked threat itself. Now you'll see in this one, there's a number of undesirable events identified. Now. This was a, a non-strategic assessment in this instance. This was very tactile and, and focused on a single pro project in a single area. Um, strategic should have um, the major things that are likely to cause disruptions, whereas this one goes down to a more descriptive process of undesirable events. So mapping out to determine what things are going to happen, where our priorities should be focused, and ensuring that we're all identifying, you know, it's a, it's a job hazard identification, it's a process identification, and we've got quite a broad area. So this is not strategic in its particular approach. This is much more um, tactile, but obviously it has strategic influences and outcomes in some of these uh, areas. But a lot of this was distilled from a much higher strategic assessment. So we look at operational impacts, frequency, predictability, probability, velocity events, at duration scale event, and you can add to these particular processes, but ultimately on the right, we then end up with our graduated scale. Now it's important to have this in such a way that it's representative of being able to understand the base information. So you know, numbers can be very confusing to a lot, and more importantly, when communicating these in a degree of brevity or in a synopsis, you need to have something that executives or non-risk personnel or someone who wasn't involved in the process can understand. So by doing this, we've got the first stage, but something I always include and, and do as a comparative analysis is to put in 
where exactly is the median? You know, where is the middle ground in terms of our assessment of all of these different processes? Because it's it's very important that we step back and we have a look and we don't get lost in the forest because we're focusing on, focusing on trees. We should ensure that we've got a holistic view of the overall process. We then look at the standard deviation. You know, how far from the centre have we drifted? So if you look at predictability, for example, we've got a couple of things that are starting to go fairly uh, far away from the centre, as we do with the velocity of onset as well as the duration of events and so on um, and then obviously the average so we look at our middle ground and again you know where are we so our predictability we're up in the high fours area um, operational impact we're down in the low ones and two so again it's a, it's another means of just slicing the layers and getting a better insight to the information that we're collecting now some of this information is empirical it's historical data but then obviously we're looking at forecasts so we're using some of that predictive analysis based on you know seasonal activities and you know legacy information and and other benchmarking industries and, and also a degree of um, not fabrication or artistic license because that does go into a lot of these assessments that I've seen but it's it's an educated guess it's transparent um, and it's got a methodology and process which is replicatable and by all means it's um, certainly uh, transparent in how it's approached so that was the particular area that I was talking about before in the operational impact so on top of that, when we get these numerical values, we've got descriptors because this is part of the problem is individuals interpret certain statements or standards uh, particularly vague, but they have to be very, very specific. So you'll see some of these measured in months, days, hours, um, probabilities. Yeah, this is an example I put in here because it's a bit like the weather, you know, a chance of clouds or possibility of rain. It needs to be much more descriptive than single or, or even double words unless it's a timeline like months or days. So you have to be very concise and, and even using drop down boxes and so on to, to replicate and standardize the process, which makes it easier for people to complete um, who are not necessarily doing it, who are not engaged in risk management as a full time occupation. They do this as part of their business. So, again, facilitating. Um, the enhancement of completion of these tools uh, is paramount, uh, but also how the information is then represented. So there's a number of sub-analysis that then comes out of that. So we've got our naked threats. You know, this is before we're even looking at countermeasures and treatment solutions because far too often people jump straight in their threat assessments to, you know, this is what we have in place and this is what we're going to have in place, and the whole process gets lost. You need to start with a naked assessment that is a, a baseline in which to improve from or to measure against. So in this instance, we're looking at the adversarial elements so you know who are they what are their needs wants and indicators and, and what are they interested in you know in term and also giving them a degree of gravity associated to the process so there's sub analysis comes out of the overall risk assessment so it's not just about a single dashboard dial or, or gauge um, they do exist but they're typically got layers upon layers and upon layers of information that goes into that and you shouldn't get lost in that particular focus and this is one of those sub analysis trees or routes that you will indicatively find in some of the better systems. Now, that information that we saw earlier, um, for some people, the numbers, again, can be overwhelming. You can replicate and, and uh, change this or even mix it up, and you can start to see different trends or different patterns occur um, by using you know, icons and flags and, and various indicators. Very simple to employ, but often overlooked by, by security pur purists or risk and, uh, assessment purists who focus purely on the methodology or the science or the mathematics. Uh, at the end of the day, you need to be able to visually identify some of these things, particularly when you've got voluminous amounts of data. So again, that's the same information in, in three or four different uh, uh, subsets. So we've got an alert function on the left, and then we look at the top 10%, and then we look at heat zones, we've got cascading, and then we've got quartile. So we've got the bottom 25%, you know, the, the, the next quadrant, the, the third quadrant, and the fourth quadrant being in the red, you know, the 75% and above. So again, we start to see different trends and different concepts, and we can also help prioritize our process. So we can focus on, you know, we might not uh, solve all the ailments, uh, but you know what, we have time and focus and, and uh, budgets to focus on the top 25%, and that's where we're going to start. You may also find that your top 25%, once you've rectified and introduced treatment and corrective solutions, that it negates or certainly reduces a number of those 50s um, and 25%. So it, it, again, it's an executive decision. It's a strategic process. Um, you shouldn't just randomly uh, pick a number of these processes, but you should be engaged at an appropriate level and set yourself a project timeline. So to, to eliminate or reduce the top uh, 15 or 25 percent but again you can't do that until you've measured and qualified in a quantitative approach um, what all of those particular hazards and threats may be.
Any further information, please reach out and contact me. That's all for now. Thank you and goodbye.